Well, hi, I'm so happy to say hi, and I'm so happy to have my good friend Mary on today. And um, she has helped me actually get into the whole food groove. A long time ago, she was the first one. I had the standard American diet until uh, one of my children was having problems. And so please welcome Mary. Mary, I'm so happy to have you. Oh, hi, Sue. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. And um, so a long time ago, I was, my, one of my kids was having trouble with growing. And do you remember what book you recommended to me? You actually gave it to me. I do. I remember we were having coffee and you were telling me about your son and how he was having digestive issues and you were worried about growth problems and so on and so forth. And I said, Sue, you need to read Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. And I gave you the book. <laughs> and, and I, I still have it. It, <laughs> it is well worn. There are a lot of uh, spills on this beautiful book that you gave me. And, um, and you also, for a while, you had us, uh, you had a group of us there where we would occasionally get together at your house. That was so much fun. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, we were in our homeschooling group and those of us who enjoyed Nourishing Traditions and the Weston A. Price Foundation, which Sally Fallon, the author, had founded. And uh, we would get together uh, and I, we'd rotate to the different homes and we'd make different ferments. I think we did sauerkraut and uh, various other things. And uh, I think we made uh, different cheeses at one house and soaked beans at another and just kind of worked our way through the little basics of, uh, of the Nourishing Traditions book. And it was wonderful because for me, this was very important when uh, Sally came out with her book. And I used to, this is back before there really was no traditional foods movement yet. And I would call her up on the phone and we would chat, you know. <laughs> it was so informal back then. And now she's the author of so many books that followed, you know, in the, uh, in the footsteps of Nourishing Traditions. But it was always very important to me because this is how I was raised. You know, my parents are the product. My mother was born in the 1920s and the products of the 19, products of the 1930s uh, growing up and uh, then World War II and so on and so forth. Nothing was wasted. Everything was made homemade. There was always a garden. Bone broth was always simmering on the stove. Sometimes in my father's case, I'll share with you uh, that sometimes all they had were the bones because they couldn't afford the meat during the depression. And the butcher would look kindly on them and give them some bones. And my uh, grandmother, Mary, after whom I'm named, uh, would uh, simmer the bones and make bone broth. And as we know, uh, there's so many nutrients, you know, with the gelatin and so on and so forth and good gut health. And uh, a couple of years ago, when, while my father was still alive, I was sharing with him about the resurgence and the popularity of bone broth and how you could pay as much as $12 a jar. And he was laughing hysterically. He's like, it's the food of the poor has become all shishi. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but that, uh, you know, being raised like that, you know, my, and so those traditions that my mother had, those nourishing traditions, uh, she carried on, you know, into uh, her married life and raising me and uh, we had all kinds of bone broth. My mother wasted nothing. I often get a kick out of today how people uh, talk about being, um, what is it like? green, you know, and like recycling and all of that. I don't know what the exact terminology for it is. Right. Eco-friendly. Eco-friendly, that's it. Eco My mother was eco-friendly in the 1930s. I think everyone was. But, um, you know, every, nothing was wasted. You had a turkey at Thanksgiving. Every scrap of meat came off of that. The bones were made into broth. My mother-in-law did the same thing, you know. Right. And... So being raised like that, and then you go off, you grow up, you go to college, you're working, you're busy, you're this, you're that. Next thing you know, you're eating at restaurants a lot. And, you know, of course, you know, I lived in New York City. And you're eating out, you're rushing, you're working long hours, and you forget about these things. Right. And 
you, you're not necessarily in bad health because you're young. Right. And you think that you're, you know, infallible and you go on and you're eating at restaurants and nothing wrong with restaurant food, but it's not the same at, or I don't think as nutrient dense or nutrient rich as what you can make at home. Right. And you're spending money and you're eating out here, you're eating out there, this, that, and the other thing. And then when I got married, as you know, I had a baby in my early forties and you start to feel a few aches and pains and you're thinking, <laughs> You know, maybe maybe I need to be really studying on what what am I eating, and then Sally's book came out, and I said, "Oh my gosh, of course, this is the food of my youth." And because I was, you know, a busy young woman working and going to school, this that and the other thing, and it was when I became a mother. I had a wake up call and I was like, I want to get back to how I was raised and I want to raise my son the way I was raised on these nutrient rich foods. Right. Well, that does, it, it tugs at you when your kids, you really, you want yeah. to, moms want to nourish their kids. So oh, yeah. your mother- oh, I was just gonna say one thing, I didn't mean to interrupt, forgive me, but something about you that I always have a wonderful memory of and I have shared this story with so many people and I don't know if you'll remember, but we were all having a discussion, you, me, and some of the other moms, about how to get liver into our kids. And you said, I have the best recipe. And I have shared this with so many people. <laughs> yeah, get the liver out. But you were so cute because you said, make sure it's kind of partially frozen. Otherwise, it can be a real mess. <laughs> and you said, partially frozen, cut it up in little bits, batter dip it, you know, a little flour or something, fry it up in lard, and you got like nuggets, you know? <laughs> some fermented ketchup and you're good to go. And I have shared that so many times with young mothers who were trying to figure out how to get liver into their kids. I said, oh, my friend Sue has the best recipe. They'll take <laughs> nuggets and they'll just dip it in ketchup. And eat it. <laughs> oh, my poor younger kids, we're hardcore now. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> so... Yeah, we we still have the liver. I mean, that was really uh, revolutionary to me that you would, because I was not raised like that. Mm -hmm. You know, to think, oh yeah, the organs. You you can't waste these things. The bones. You know, all of it is worth something. And how do you how do you use it? Um. So did your mom teach you to cook this way, or did you um, or did you learn when you were older? No, my mother taught me how to cook okay. and from a very young age. You know, I was always in the kitchen with her and sort of my earliest recollections were, I'm thinking maybe about four, you know, it's, I haven't gone to school yet. Yeah. And it was very cute because I must have been talking to her or something in the kitchen, you know, and I always had a little apron, you know, back, this is the very early 1960s, you know, and you this, love your aprons now too. I know, I really do. I really do. <laughs> and I've ruined so many clothes <laughs> and learned because I'm like, with the way you, when you're cooking and you're the meats and then the bones and oh my gosh, it can be such a mess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my mom and I, I would think it was about four or so and something came up about toast and she said today you're going to have your first cooking lesson and i'm going to teach you how to make proper toast <laughs> that started with learning how to make bread <laughs> oh really yes. oh wow <laughs> that's before quick you can, before you can make toast you gotta know how to make bread i mean that's true yeah and you know, so and she, you're talking about the organs. Um, back then, chickens were expensive, more kind of like how they are more expensive today. And meat was inexpensive, so we would eat meat during the week, fish on Friday, of course, and liver on Wednesday. It was the sort of the routine: liver and onions on Wednesday, fish on Friday, and meat the rest of the days. And then on Sunday would be the big roast chicken, back in the day when you could get those big roasting chickens. And they came with all the innards. And she would cook and cut up the gizzard. My gosh, that was a treat. And the heart and the liver, she'd fry them up in a little pan and say, always tell me these are very good for you, always eat these. I grew up love, lo loving all of that. Wow. And not thinking that it was gross or unattractive, you know. And I'll tell you a story about making bread. 
my, as you know, my mother's Italian, my father is Irish. And my father, uh, as a young man, a boy really, w living in Jersey, and he worked in a little like a grocery type store, uh, you know, where they had like the pickles in the barrel, you know, real old fashioned little grocery store. And that man would give him some liverwurst and he loved liverwurst. And next door to the little grocery store was a German bakery. And that was Mrs. Linda. And my father grew up learning to love rye bread. Well, my mother wanted to make, you know, being a nice sweet wife, wanted to make my father happy and know how to make rye bread. Now she was making sourdough. That was very common back then, you know, to start, make your own starter and all of that. Mothers just seem to all know how to do that. And, but my father really liked rye bread. So she said, I have to figure out how to do this. And my father said, I think I can get, you know, rye flour, you know, he worked in New York City. I think I can get rye flour in the city. And he brought her home some rye flour and she made a starter with rye flour and it was so easy and it worked like a charm easier than trying to do it with white flour which could take oh. more days yeah. and, and now that's kind of like the little trick if you like to make sourdough bread start your starter with a little rye flour oh. and you'll see how easier it will be to do because a lot of people struggle making the starter with just white flour but so she would like teach me all these little things and little Look at all the wisdom too from the, these traditional ways of doing it. I'm even thinking when you said liver on Wednesday, fish on Friday, like mm -hmm. the roast chicken on Sunday. I mean, we're kind of going back to that out of necessity because it's so hard to generate new things all the time. But if you have a little rhythm and pattern, then you can maybe, you know, every once in a while if you want to mix it up. But if we have some go-to recipes, it makes life a little easier. Do you it, really, it really does. Now, do you have a pattern or favorite recipes that you uh, make a lot? Um, I do. I pretty much have, uh, I, I always laugh at, uh, I think it's, uh, was it Jamie Oliver is the British chef and cookbook yeah. author. Is that his name? I think Jamie, so. Jamie Oliver. He has a, a system where on Sunday, he makes what he calls the mothership meal. And I <laughs> love that idea. And I'm kind of of the same way. Yeah. I make a mothership meal, that's Sunday dinner. Um, something, you know, that we eat like around, you know, one or two o'clock on Sunday. And I usually like to roast a chicken. And this comes from my upbringing, you know, yeah. that Sunday. And today chickens are so expensive. It's got to be a special meal, you know. Right. And so I love that mothership meal, as, as I learned from Jamie Oliver to call it. I think that's very cute. And I, ro I often roast a chicken on Sunday. And then that gives me leftovers for making a nice uh, chicken soup on Monday and or, or some type of soup on Monday right um, it could be just your standard basic chicken soup or something that you jazz up and change up a little bit but usually Monday is nice Monday night is nice to make a soup because I think the first even and even in the summer you know my husband Ted and Ben when before he went to college they like a hot meal it can be 110 degrees outside but they like a hot dinner you know, they don't well, my family too, but I think yeah. they get, you just get used to it and you just get used to it. And so uh, no matter what time it is, not what time of year it is, that soup on Monday is nice. And why I like the soup is Mondays can be first day of the week and, you know, well, Sunday's first day of the week, but first day of the work week can be very hectic. Yeah. Everybody's getting back into the groove. There's often a lot of things that need to be caught up on, uh, whatever the case may be. So knowing that on Monday you're going to do a soup with leftovers that you have from your main meal that you made on Sunday is very nice and it's very easy for me. And then Tuesday at that point, if I have a little chicken left over from that, yeah, because I'll pick some nice pieces for the soup, but then I'll pick every little last piece of chicken off the carcass. Yeah. And might chop that up and make chicken tacos or you know something like that, you know, for Tuesday. Um, if I don't have enough left over, then I usually will try to do a fish. 
And at the same time, at that point, the chicken carcass is very well stripped and I'll get a bone broth going in the crock pot. Although now I have to sort of get with the program and find out all about this instant pot business. <laughs> yet. But um, yeah, so Tuesday, you know, will be, so Monday you've got the soup. I know I've got my main meal Sunday. Monday we're going to have soup. Tuesday it might be some more chicken that's left over in some very creative way. If not, I usually try to do fish. And the reason is I try to get fish in more than just once a week. Right. For any particular reason? For health. Just for health. Yeah. yeah. Just for health. You know, they always say eat fish. And, and Ted and Benjamin like it. You know, we don't eat a lot of red meat. I love it. I, lo I could eat steak every day. But Ted and Ben were never super big meat eaters. Ben a little more so when he was younger. But as he got older, they really gravitate to fish and chicken. So that's yeah. tends to be what I rely on. And then Wednesday, uh, you know, it, it try to just think of something creative or, you know, maybe yeah. chicken, chicken breast. I don't do chicken, the boneless, skinless ones too much. It goes against my, <laughs> I don't know, it's hard. I have them in my freezer, you know, I'll get some just at a cost. Case. But it's, it's just, I want that whole chicken. You know, and the breasts are so expensive, you know, but uh, but I do have them, you know, for emergencies in one month. But that's kind of my rhythm. If my family would eat it as a regular meal, I would make liver and onions. But I think that there might be a little objection to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to hide it. <laughs> yeah. You're funny. Yeah. No, that's that's kind of how we do it, too, is um, it just we have certain things because I told you before we have an Amish farmer that we we get some um, really good uh, groceries from and so we get liver every week and we get fish every week from him and then you know we do the bulk beef order um, so but I have to tell you that um, I picked up some tips from you on I know you have a YouTube channel now and I thought this was so great because you, you're always like the, um, how do you call it? Like when someone draws people together and then you're like a, t a natural teacher. Oh, and, thank you. And even though our group isn't, you know, uh, geographically all together, so now you've kind of ventured into these new, this new um, foray, and you're, but you're still doing that where you're still, you know, being a real um, ambassador for nourishing foods and can you tell us a little bit about your new projects oh i enjoy it so much i've been wanting to do it so long you know i think you might remember i tried food blogging when benjamin was younger but it's hard you know when you're raising a family and also as you know you know i ha have aging parents and being an older mom you know i felt very much that sandwich generation so my time really had to be focused on my family and my extended family. And now that Ted and I are empty nesters, I said, you know, food vlogging, it's like, now there's YouTube. You know? So I'm like, oh, right. wow, I'm going to make videos. <laughs> <laughs> and I really enjoy it because I do think it's very kind of you, what you say about being a teacher. I think I, I really have the heart of a teacher and I enjoy, uh, I enjoy teaching people how to cook and especially starting with the basics and that's even more than a teacher even more than a teacher you're a mentor really oh, thank, you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you that's kind of you to say but uh, yeah i just wanted to start with real basic things and uh, so that's why i started first with okay this is how you roast a chicken and tell us what's the name of your youtube oh, channel it's called mary's nest <laughs> yeah it's great. I really highly recommend it. I, I mean, you know me, I've been making uh, bone broth for a long time. I was like, oh, <laughs> I picked up some things. Oh, this is funny. really good. <laughs> That's kind of you to say. It's kind of you to say. Yeah, it's just, it's new, you know, right now I just have a few videos on there and, and uh, we'll be adding, I'm going to put up another one tomorrow uh, because I'm in a, in addition to just sort of little by little add, adding to what I call my Mastering the Basics series. I also do, uh, do other little things that I add that I have a social circle of ladies who like to do things like pantry challenges 
And one uh, for this week is, uh, was uh, inventorying and organizing your freezer. And Sue, I have to tell you, you can relate to this. I found 16 packages of sea kelp cubes in my freezer. <laughs> I'm like, why did I buy this? <laughs> you know, and I remembered like, and I really thought about it. And then somebody said, oh, was it like for smoothies? And I was like, oh my gosh, yes. And I must have gotten a good buy. Leave out the reason. But yeah, so I'll just be adding to it, you know, different, uh, different videos each week. I've got, I did a couple on, and, and they're basic. And, uh, but at the same time, I wanted to do things that were basic but very detailed. Because I found that sometimes when I watched videos on YouTube, people assumed sometimes a little knowledge that may not be there. And that's why in the roasting the chicken one, I start with how to, I show different chickens and how to pick out the chicken at the grocery store. No, and, it's really important, yeah. You know, how to make it affordable, because that's another thing that's really near and dear to my heart is, the whole traditional foods movement, I think, is wonderful. We can't do better. I mean, we can't do anything better than get away from the standard American diet. That's really let us down a, a, a poor a health, a, a path of poor health. Right. And, but at the same time, I get a little worried with the traditional foods movement because it can be very expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to Whole Foods, a chicken can be $25. That's right. pasture raised and gets their number four rating. Uh, raw milk here now is going for around $12 a gallon. Ooh, that's really expensive. It's very expensive, you know, and right now we're not even getting any because of the drought, you know. Right. It's very dry here, so it's hard on the cows. But uh, well, the ordering sprouted flowers and this, that, and the other thing, it, it's expensive and overwhelming. It really and so, is. And so I wanted to make a YouTube channel that made this approachable and affordable. Yeah. To say, it's okay if you buy a chicken at the grocery store. <laughs> if you get a pasture raised and organic, that's wonderful. But if your food budget only allows for you to buy the chicken that's $5 at the grocery store, for me, at least, this is just in my humble opinion. I know it's not raised the best, but it's better than the fast food restaurant. And I think you're right. You, you're know, right. you cook it, you cook it, mm -hmm. you serve it with love, you stay in your grocery budget, you don't stress yourself out, you don't stress your family. Right. That, to me, uh, I just think that it's, that's nutritious. Right. And if it's the one thing, like if someone decides they want to learn how to make chicken broth and they just do that and that's what they add to the repertoire this year, they're, you're better off doing that one yeah, thing. That one thing. Exactly. Um, and I think that's how we all started. When yes. We, when we all met as, as mothers of young children and I think all of us, when, as little by little, I think everybody in our group at some, at one point, uh, got the nourishing traditions. Book. Oh yeah, <laughs> and we were all talking about making bone broth. We were all making bone broth. We may have not been doing anything else, but we were all making bone broth. Right, right. And I and I think that that improves your health so many fold. I I, I don't I can't say enough about bone broth. I always have it going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the nice thing too is that, and something I mentioned in the video where I talk about the bone broth, you can make that what they call the perpetual bone broth. You don't just, you know, people say, well, the bones might be a little expensive, but you're gonna get multiple batches of broth out of those bones. You right. can keep reusing them. I know some people who get 12 batches of broth out of one set of bones. And I never ever considered that. Now, so we get, when we get our bones, uh, because we usually go in on a uh, part of a cow, and mm -hmm. so we always just tell the butcher, anyone, give us all the bones that people don't, <laughs> want. People don't want them, you know? But mm -hmm. if, if you go to the grocery store, yeah, I've never really bought gro bones, but mm -hmm. I, it, I never considered that you could do that, and of course you could. Yes, 
you can keep leaching the the uh, nutrients out of the bones Great. Uh, for quite a while. And the nice thing is, I don't know if you've had a chance to read Sally's book. Um, I think she calls it nourishing broth. I actually have. I bought that one. You have that? Okay. Yeah. Isn't that yes, a wonderful? Book? It's amazing. And and I love this. You know, remember back in the day we were leaving the pot on the stove for 72 hours. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now I love the fact that, you know, she's revisited this and say, you know, 12 hours will do the trick and then you can make another batch and another batch. You right. Know? And everybody sleeps better when the stove's not on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In our last house, uh, we had a gas stove. So I, ca I there's, I can't leave a, no, I can't leave a flame. Yeah. So yeah. And I, but I've never done it in a crock pot, but that looked really interesting that we could I, I love it. And yeah. I think it's so easy. Right. And but now people are telling me, I don't know if you've gotten one of these multi cooker, pressure cooker, Instapod, you know, the various other brands. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to see if it makes a gelatinous broth. I'm a little skeptical. I do I have too. one. <laughs> but I'm like, you're not going to boil it for 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But who knows? I mean, I mean, I do have a good friend who does it and she claims that you can do it really quickly and it's got all the same nutrients. And I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm just, I don't know. yeah. And even, it's even try, but you know, how can it be the same if I guess the pressure helps it instead of the time? Yeah. I don't know, but it's interesting because in that book that we have the nourishing broth, yeah. Her, uh, Sally's co-author, Kayla, I don't remember her name, but she does hers in a book. Yeah. And she talks about it in the book. Mm -hmm. And she and Sally don't agree on it, but I find it interesting <laughs> that they're, yeah. they're different perspectives. Yeah. That's really good. So um, what's your very favorite thing to make, Mary? Oh, my gosh. Well, I hate to keep coming back to it because I probably sound like a broken record, but I could roast a chicken every day. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love roast chicken and um, that that I make a lot of them and I have always have a lot of bone broth because I make a lot of them because I roast the chicken once I get three carcasses and six feet boom in the crock pot and just going all the time. But there's something very homey and it must uh, go back to my childhood because my mother always roasted a chicken on Sunday. Probably. I find, I find it homey and cozy and it's always a good, a, uh, you know, a good meal. And really for me, it's sort of the original, um, what's the expression people say, one dish or one pot meal. Yeah. Because you can put that chicken in the roasting pan, throw in carrots, onions, and celery, and some potatoes, and you don't need to make anything else. Yeah. You know, it's it's good to go. Your mom was doing all the hip things back in the yeah. day. Before they were hip. <laughs> well, you know, and I think all the mothers, I think a lot of mothers were, you know, a lot of mothers were. But uh, yeah, my mother, uh, it, it's funny, she's 93 now. And do you realize she has nothing wrong with her? That's amazing. <laughs> my mother has never been hospitalized other than to give birth. She's never had surgery. I mean, I find her phenomenal. Um, and, and every Wednesday we go out to lunch and her digestion is amazing. And I really believe this is from all the good food that she ate all her life. Mm -hmm. And she always being Italian, she loves to go for Italian food. And we'll go to the Italian restaurant. Last Wednesday, she was eating spicy sausage. She's 93 <laughs> years old. I find that fantastic. Her gut health must be through the roof, you know? Yeah. Probably, it's, you know, so, but that's probably something that I like to make. And then uh, I think over the years, I've gotten to be a much better uh, fish uh, cooker, uh, learning, you know, learning that not to overcook it and gotten right. much better at that. And something, it's funny in being married and something that Ted enjoys that uh, I, I've really come to enjoy making and it's so easy. And it's a wonderful clean out the fridge kind of thing is fried rice. Oh, I, I find that um, I will make rice, and yes, it's white rice and all this, that, and the other thing. But I, you know, I, I don't. I'm not a fanatic. You know, I'm not like, oh, it has to be brown rice. You know, <laughs> you know, I like to think of does my husband like it? 
Do we enjoy eating it? I really feel right. that's part of good health too. Oh yeah. Is it homemade? Is it home cooked? Do you enjoy eating it? Is it served with love? All of these things go into good digestion. Mm -hmm. And, but I'll make the white rice and instead of water, I always use bone broth and butter and, you know, me and my butter, I've got nine pounds in the freezer right now. It's the <laughs> only way I can be happy and sleep at night. <laughs> and I'll make the rice like that and then I'll make a big batch and we'll have some with dinner. And then I put the rest in the fridge because, you know, when it's hard like that, then it makes great fried rice. And then I use uh, naturally fermented soy sauce and I throw in whatever vegetables I have and some sesame seeds and I'll fry up a couple of eggs and I get those nice uh, little farm eggs. Sometimes I was getting them from our mutual friend, Michelle. Yeah. When she was, uh, has, uh, her That's daughter would kill the eggs, which was so cute. But nice farm fresh eggs, that's delicious. And it's, you know, white rice can be a nice vehicle to get good nutrition into people who may be new to eating real food or traditional food. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's another problem too, if you, uh, which is understandable because I think we have all been like this over the years, we, you, me, and some of the other gals, we get very excited about it. We're like, gung-ho, we're making everything. And then our families are like, yikes. What did you put in front of me? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, right. whole, it's whole wheat. It's like, oh, you know. <laughs> but if you slowly introduce these things, and I, I remember, and really, I hadn't thought much about white rice. And actually, it was Michelle who uh, really got me thinking about it because we were in the car one day and she had a little bowl that, that uh, she was feeding the baby. And she said, oh, I'm not worried, you know, that it's white rice. She felt necessary to like explain to me like I was the <laughs> fanatic nourishing. <laughs> and I'm like, don't worry about it. And she said, oh, but I make it with bone broth. I said, that's genius. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And so I know my family like white rice more than brown rice. And so I just, I, and I want the meal to be pleasing and pleasant, familiar. That's very important. These foods need to be familiar when you're introducing them and trying to encourage people to change their pattern of eating. And making white rice in bone broth and adding half a stick of butter, how can you go wrong? <laughs> you got the butter. <laughs> I got the butter. Me and Julia Child, you know, add more butter. Solves and me the too. Problem. I'm right behind you. I'm like, don't forget the butter. <laughs> butter really does make everything better. It makes everything better. It I really mean, does. butter... Butter is just delicious. And I, I laughed as a wonderful cooking segment for years ago when Jacques Pepin and Julia Child had a little cooking show together on PBS. And he added maybe a tablespoon of butter. And she said, you're going to add more butter, right? And he says, oh, I am. I'm just going to let this melt first. And she said, oh, good. Because if you weren't, I was adding heavy cream. <laughs> <laughs> that fat was going to get in there somehow. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> oh, Mary, this has been fantastic to be chatting with you. And where else can we find you on social media? Well, everything is Mary's Nest, you know. Mary's so Nest. my Twitter is Mary's Nest. My Facebook is Mary's Nest. And what's the other one? Pinterest and Instagram. It's all the same. And okay. I have the website, marysnest.com. And from there, they can find the YouTube channel. Well, Mary, I'm so appreciative that you spent the time with us chatting and um, letting people get to know you. So oh, Sue, thank you so much for having me. You're such a doll, and you've been on this journey with me for, for so many years. Uh, and it's really, it's really been a blessing to me to, to be on this journey with you. Oh, thank you, Mary. It was a pleasure.